It's so good. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word. God, we thank you, Lord, for this privilege and opportunity we got to come share your word in your house with your people. God, we ask you, Lord, to anoint me this morning. God, as your voice, God, as your hands, as your mouth to speak to your people, God. Lord, let it be relevant, God. Let it be engraved in our hearts, God. Lord, that when the enemy tries to come in, God, we got our war weapons ready. God, that we can say, thus saith the Lord. God, open it. The word to our, our minds and our hearts and our souls to the point, God, that we understand it. God, that we can be able to run with it. In the name of Jesus, Lord, hide me behind the cross. Don't let me be seen, God, but let you be seen. Help me decrease that you might decrease. God, let your kingdom be filled. In the name of Jesus, let the people of God say amen. amen. If you would, turn to 2 Kings 24. And eleven. And while you turn that, there's a place in our lives as Christians that we come to where we ask God for something and we pray for it and we, we know that God's going to do it. But there's a time in between the waiting period that is called the meantime. In other words, God has set you to a point or put you in a place or a position to where you know where you're going, but there's a waiting kind of time in between and most people say well I, I'm going to Walmart but in the meantime I'm going you see what I'm saying there's a place in God that is the meantime and the meantime is not a place for you to sit down it's not a place for you just to sit there and wait for God just to miraculously put together some, some pixie dust or whatever it is just throw it out there and all of a sudden everything just changes before your eyes the Bible said that faith without works is what? Yes. So therefore, if you ain't moving, your faith ain't active, then you're dead. And your situation's going to stay dead. If I go to Randall's work and I say, Randall, I want to pay for four tires. And I get them money out and I pay for it, but Randall never goes in there to change the tires. My meantime is going to be a long wait. But if I could ever get Randall to say, you know what? Them tires ain't getting on unless I do something. Come on. Yeah. The tires ain't going to jump on themselves. I don't care how much magic you got. Them tires are not going to get on themselves, are they? That's right. You can go out there with the wrong tools and them tires ain't being changed. Amen? Right. If you ain't got the right equipment, you'll never get them tires off. Not only that, if you ain't got the right attitude or the right mindset or the knowledge how to use the equipment that's there, you'll never get your tires changed. Same way is in Christ. When Christ wants you to do something in ministry, He equips you with the necessary tools and the knowledge that you need to do that ministry. You don't have to put yourself in a position that you don't know nothing about because Christ Himself will give you the knowledge through the Spirit of God. If you're a pastor, the pastor will be on you. If you're a teacher, the knowledge of a teacher will come on you. If you are a Sunday school teacher, the knowledge of a Sunday school teacher will come on you. Now, if you are here and you're able to clean the church and that's all you do, but the, the knowledge for cleaning that church is on you. You know good and well that you can't pour bleach on this carpet. Amen. Amen. You know good and well that the vacuum cleaner we got cannot pick up water. Same thing is with the church in, in general. If you are called to do a calling, God expects you to study to show, to show yourself approved of that calling. You cannot get up and minister if all you've done all week is lay around lazy and done nothing with the Word of God, didn't do no praying, didn't do no fasting. You are going into the battle blind with no armor, with no weapons, with nothing on you but just your knowledge. And your knowledge is nothing when it comes to the Word of God. Let God be truth and every man be a Why? Because He is truth. You can't do nothing without Him. My righteousness is filthy rags. I don't care what my theology is, what I believe, what I think is the truth. There's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. I'd rather follow Jesus and know that I'm right than to have my own opinion and fall in hell. Amen. Amen. But there's a meantime in the Lord. There's a place where you ask God for something and the work has to
to show evidence. Yeah. You can't ask God to build a church. I can't ask God to build this church if I can't go and call and visit and pray for people and ask people to come. If I say, God, I want you to fill this church and all I've done was sit on that pew, then this church will be just where it's at if it don't fall off. Why? Because that meantime is the time for me to put my faith into action. That meantime is not a place for me to sit and just twiddle my thumbs. That meantime is not a place for me to be saved and satisfied and not moving. The meantime is the place for you to move and to put in action your faith which you pray for and watch the evidence start coming around when the meantime starts to come about. A meantime. Turn around to your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't be stagnant in God's work. Learning how to live involves learning how to live in the meantime. Listen to this. A significant portion of life is spent in the meantime. The meantime of plans and fulfillment of dreams and reality, uncertainty and assurance, planting and harvesting. Sometimes the meantime is the time that follows surgery or divorce or emotional breakdown or loss of the loved one. How are we to live when a meantime invades our life? How are you to live? How is life going to go on when my life's been turned upside down? Some of us have people in the hospital. Some of us have people that's done dying. The struggle is real. The pain is real. The emotions, the feelings. But you're not to stay in that emotional state. As a child of God, you should not have fear in your heart. As a child of God, you should have the fruits of the Spirit, which label you as having peace and contentment in God and love and prosperity and everything else that goes along with it. Because the attributes that you show as a Christian ought to reflect the, the, the God or the Jesus that you serve. If you got somebody in the hospital that's sick and you ask God to heal them, you ought to stop praising God for that healing in your meantime. You ought to start giving God thanks for bringing them out in the meantime. Because what's happening while you wait, the devil likes to sneak in and put doubt and confusion in your mind. The devil likes to come in and destroy what you think is real in God and what you know is real in God. Because if he can get you to doubt it, he has got 50% of the battle won. Think about it. You ever seen a boxer go into the ring with one boxing glove on? He'd have some of really good assurance in that right hook if he did. He'd have more faith than the feller over. But say the two things gonna happen. Either he's gonna walk in there and knock him out, or he's gonna walk in there and get knocked out. Because he wasn't prepared for the battle. His meantime study wasn't preparing him. God expects everyone that's in a spot between what you pray for and your answer to go ahead and give him thanks for what he's already done. There's no use to sit back and just let the devil just destroy your mind. And so you don't understand. I, I had this and other happen. I had this and other, this year happen. And I went to this and this. God understands your struggle. He said, I won't put no more on you than you can stay that I won't make a way of escape. You see, there's a way of escape. But if you're not active and not moving and not being moving around in your faith and waiting on, you can't sit around and wait on it. you got to look for your exit strategy. you got to look for it. you got to know that, hey, God's made a way of escape. Let me start worshiping Him. Let me start praising Him. Let me, let me make it to where God so I can get out of this situation. But no, most of us, when we get in that state, we want to sit down and start calling on the phone. Oh, you won't believe what just happened. I'm so pitiful. I need you to get three people together and pray that God does something. Hurry up and move because my faith ain't done nothing. It's on anchor. I see it so many times. I'm not getting on nobody. I just want to tell you the truth. It's, it's right, isn't it? 
devil's been riding my back all week. He's been doing this and he's been doing You brag on the devil when you do God. Sometimes the devil didn't even do it. You've done it. You're giving the devil credit for it. The devil's been doing this. Most of us wear a poverty or a pity or a pity party badge and we use it as a badge of honor instead of something that we need to pray over. We wear it like a police badge. A badge of honor. The devil's been in my finances this week. I need for three people to bless me with $300. See my badge? I run out of pills. It's in church, ain't gonna keep in Obamacare. In church, nowhere in Obamacare. You can't even get Tic Tacs on Obamacare. I need somebody to pray. We as children of God ought to believe in the God that we serve. Don't put, don't profess it if you don't possess it. Don't go around claiming you got the victory if you can't even pray over your sore toe. Amen. Come on, God's tired of, of us feeling like we're weak. He gave you all the armor and all the knowledge and He gave you the Word of God and how to fight the devil, but yet we're too lazy to read and to activate the power that's already within us. Come on, somebody, shake yourself and wake up. Say, I believe that I'm healed. I believe that God died for me. I believe that all things work together for my good because I love the Lord. Let the devil know who you serve. He don't mind telling you who he is, reminding who he is. In the meantime, in Jeremiah, well, let's go back to 2 Kings 24 and 11 first. Put that up if you will. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. Go 12. I only know that name. Jeholi Nebuchadnezzar. The king of Judah went out to the king of Babylon, him, his mother, and his servants, and his princes, and the officers, and the kings of Babylon, took him in the eighth year of his reign. One more, come on. And he carried out thence all the treasures, what? Of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king's house, and cut in pieces all the vessels of the gold which Solomon, king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. Keep on. And he carried away all Jerusalem and all the, the princes and all the mighty men of valor. See that right there, mighty men of valor? You know what that is? That's all the strong men. Even 10,000 captains and all the craftsmen smiths, none remain to save the poorest sort of the people of the land. In other words, he came in and he took all the goodies. Everything that was of value, everything not only of value, monetary like money and jewelry and gold and rubies and, and I probably there is wine there too, I don't know. But not only that, but it took their strong men. Anybody that would come against them. He went ahead and go and just take them everything. All I want you to leave is the poorest of the poor and the people who think they're weak. Leave them behind. The people who won't fight. The people who are just satisfied. The people who will just sit down and let us do what we want to do. That, does that sound familiar? we got churches full of people who want to come to church, but they don't want to do no fighting when it comes to the kingdom of God. They just want to sit right along with the crowd. You see, all this was happening. People were coming in. Take it, take it, take it, take it. You ever felt like in your life that people take more from you than what they would give you? That people take more than what you receive? That you give out so much and nobody appreciates what you do? That if they would appreciate what you do in money, you'd be richer than Donald Trump. But ain't nobody appreciate you. See what happened here? They come and got everything that was appreciated. But they left the people who were in poverty.
Later on, if you'll go over to Jeremiah 29 and 5, we're going somewhere, trust me. Jeremiah 29 and 5, won't you stay right there? When you're in the point of asking, or when you're in the point of struggle, or when you're in the point where you feel like there has to be something else to do and God hadn't done it yet, that's the place of meantime. That's the place where we have to get to where we say, you know what? Between here and the answer, I can't be stagnant. Between here and my victory, I cannot just sit here on my blessed assurance and just hope and pray that God's going to do something. The Bible says that we have to be moving. We have to do something. Because you know, remember, the faith without works is dead. So my faith has to activate something inside me that says, hey, i got to get to work. i got to get to moving. Something's got to happen. I can't be in this place of, of nothingness. I can't be in this place of distraught. I can't be in this place of weight. Because if I just stay here, I'm going to be in this place of meantime for a long time. I need to get to where I'm going. What we need to do as a church is when we, in the meantime, get our get our sights focused on the mark of the high calling and start walking toward the end of the victory train. Don't worry about what's in the past. Keep our minds focused on the point of arrival that when we get there, we know that God's going to meet us there. Amen? We, don't, we, don't, we can't sit and just wait. We can't do it. Jeremiah told him, he said, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what, what they produce. That's Jeremiah 25, 29 and 5. And then whatever, whatever else you need to do, but don't sit still. Don't sit there. Do something. Do something. This is why Jeremiah instructed to build houses, settle down and plant gardens and, and eat what they produce because they were to do the next thing they needed to realize life must move on. It's got to. It has to. What if Jesus would have come down to earth? He didn't made it. He's already a child. But he didn't do a thing until his father called him home. What kind of ministry would Jesus have? He knew his purpose. But what if he didn't do nothing until the cross? You know that you've got a purpose in God. The Bible said that the path of a good man is ordered and ordained by what? Of the Lord. So if you have something to do in Christ, don't you think it's time to get up and start doing it? If you've got something to do in Christ, don't you think it's time that, that, that you get up and start working toward that? We want to build a church. We want to build a new building and get out of this little small building. But don't you think it's time that we do something about that? You can't build a church without everybody on board. You can't build a kingdom without everybody on board. You can't have mixed emotions neither. Everybody's got to be in one mind, one accord, one vision. What is the vision? I'll tell you, my vision for this church is simple. To see as many come to the, the knowledge of Jesus Christ and give their heart to God to build the kingdom of God, and that's it. We solely survive to build God's kingdom. If we stay like we are, Lord bless it. But my vision is to see more than this. My vision is to see as many that will come to God. Why? Because I'm ready for it. I'm praying for it. And in the meantime, I'm not sitting down waiting on those to get on board. I'm doing something about it. What are you doing? I'm preaching the word. I'm going out visiting. I'm calling them. Where are you at? Where are you been? Some of them get mad. Well, don't call me. I'll be there when I can. Well, I love you anyway. You need prayer. Don't give up. Don't give up. Because they tell you no, that's alright. Next time they might tell you yes. 
But if you quit asking, you'll never know. You'll never know. The meantime is the time for you to get everything in order. For you to start working harder. The meantime is the preparation time. Your valley, so to speak. You see, God's coming back. But in the meantime, His children ought to be preparing themselves. Getting people ready. Getting people saved. Going to the highways and hedges. And compelling them to come in. Why? Because the meantime is about over. We're about ready to get to the harvest time. The meantime. Find something to celebrate in your meantime. Joshua told him, he said, take wives and begot sons and daughters and your wives be sons and daughters and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. Verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and I shall go and pray unto and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me. When ye shall search for me with what? With thy own with a whole heart. Now how can you go after God if you're sitting down? How can you go for God? How can you search for God if you never call on His name? How can you search for God if you're always in front of the TV or the cell phone and never get off of it long enough to have a conversation with your Lord and Savior? How often is it that we find ourselves in the meantime just sitting down instead of getting up and doing something for God? How many times have we find ourselves sleeping when Jesus was praying? Come on. He comes back and says, wake up. Can you not just pray? Just a little while longer. Jesus was serious when he was praying in the garden. The Bible said he prayed till his sweat became as blood. We pray to, we don't even pray long enough to get a sweat, Alan. Because he knew that his meantime was a time for preparation. He knew that the wait between where he was at and expected in had to be had to do something besides just sit back on his father. He knew that the devil was fighting a hundred percent. He knew that if, if the devil was fighting a hundred percent, he had to match it even more. Just like right now, the devil is out in your mind showing you things. I, I know what he is. I can look at your face. You ever look at somebody in a daydream? I know. I see you thinking. What's the devil putting in your mind to keep your mind off God? He's warned. He's warned right now. What is he doing? He's doing his job. Are you doing yours? What are you doing in the meantime? The Bible said resist the devil and he shall flee. In the meantime. Always find something to rejoice over in the meantime. What do you got to rejoice over? You got family and friends. You got a church family that you can pray for. You got life, health, and strength. You got money in the bank. Your bills are paid. You got a house over your head. You got food on your table. You're not going hungry. Come on. God will supply all your needs according to your riches, to his riches and glory. He said that he never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging bread. You got something to rejoice over. He said, I make you the head and not the tail. I put you above and not believe. You'll be the lenderer and not the borrower. You got something to rejoice over. You got something to rejoice over because when you ask the Lord in your heart, the blood was applied and your name was written down in the Lamb's book of life. So when Jesus comes back on the cloud of glory and the eastern skies are split and the trumpet shall sound, the Bible said the dead in Christ shall rise first and then that remains shall be changed to meet him. Honey, if you ain't got nothing to rejoice over, you ought to give God a praise because you are on your way to heaven if you know who he is. What are you doing in the meantime? I'm praising God. Why? Because he saved me. He delivered me. He set me free. He kept me off of drugs and alcohol. What is your testimony? Give him a praise for it. He's worthy. But in the meantime, what am I going to do? Well, honey, don't sit back. They used to say this. They said, 
Mama, hold on to the key. His daddy's about to pop the clutch. You ever heard that before? I know some of you have. Hold on to the kids, Mama. Daddy's about to pop the clutch. We're going forward. The church has been sitting down and, and, and neutral and park. Some of them's been in reverse. God's telling you to pop the clutch, honey. Hold the kids tight. We're about to go somewhere. Amen. God is so good. It says in here, so difficult times are not easy in which we can pray. But pray on, saints. Pray on. If you would turn to Psalms 30 and 5. It says, for his anger endureth but a moment. His favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy cometh in the morning. Amen. Can I say that again? Yeah. Weeping may endure. Now see that may endure. That may means it might happen. Endure for a night. So you can have joy in your night. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy is promised in the morning. What is the night? The night is the what? It's the time of waiting. It's the time that you're sitting back. When you shouldn't be. You should be praising the Lord. It's the time that you'll be giving God praise. The night for some is the meantime. The night for some is the place where they don't even see God because it's so dark in their life. They let so much come in and shade out the window of, of God. And, he, and they feel like I'm looking through the glass and, and, and it's dirty. I can't even see through it. But then when the sun starts to come up and you start seeing light at the end of the tunnel, how do you do that? By trusting God. By trusting who He is. By knowing who He is. See, there's a difference in trusting Him and knowing Him. I like to do both. But there's a difference. God, He already knows your struggles. He's looking down on you. He sees the, what the devil's doing. You see, but literally, his hands are tied until you call on him. He would love to come down and, and just sit down and, and solve your problems. But you put the, the ties on his hands of your own opinions. You put the ties on his hands of your own ways of doing things. You put the ties on his hands and you're not letting him fully get a hold of your life. I don't know why, don't ask me why we're like that, but it's called a free will. If we would just get the mind that's in us as the mind of Christ, we would get more things solved more quickly in the Spirit of God. But it's hard to do, is it not? I got all this mark, so hold on. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Six through eight. Paul wrote this to Timothy. He said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Paul knew something. He knew that the state he was in or the way of his living that he noted was fixing to come to an end. 
And he was not concerned about it. He knew that the Father had a great reward for him. He knew that to be absent from his body is to be present with a mighty God. And he knew that he had a crown with knowing. He knew that he had a, a big mansion that Jesus promised but knowing. No doubt that he had family and friends just waiting on the other side of Jordan. And he was not concerned, but he was telling him, the time of my departure is now at hand. I done fought my fight. I wasn't sitting back in the meantime. I was moving on. I was moving forward. There's nothing that I regret because I never stopped on Jesus. I kept going. My meantime was not a stop time. But now, I fought a good fight. My course is now ended. Now I'm fixing to go home. And he was telling Timothy, what are you going to do? I've done my part. I fought it. I've been through it. How many can say this morning? I've been through it. I'm still fighting it. And I'm going to fight it to the end. I'm still going to fight it. No matter what. That's what Paul was telling Timothy. Timothy, get yourself in order. You need to do what I've been doing. I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to prepare you. If you want to be with me, you need to get on this train I'm on and don't stop. Because when you stop, that's when the devil starts working. Well, ain't he working when you're going? Yeah, but when you're going, you ain't got time to pay no attention. I fought the good fight. Philippians 3. Six through eight. No, Philippians 3, 13 and 14. I'm sorry, it's the wrong thing. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind Hello? forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before here it is church I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus let us therefore as many be perfect be thus minded and if anything Ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. In other words, if you got your mind focused on the end, if you got your mind focused on Christ and making it to heaven, that's what you need to keep on pressing toward. We as Christians and, and saved individuals of God who love Jesus and claim to have the victory, we don't need to be at a point where we're saved and satisfied. Every day you come to church, you ought to be able to learn something or be willing to learn something different that you didn't know before that God can reveal to you to make you a better person than Him that you was when you walked through the door. If you leave the house of God the same way you came in, then you didn't receive nothing. You didn't. If you come into the house of God weekend after weekend or weekday, whichever it is, when the doors are open and you never change, inspect yourself. Inspect yourself. God expects you to grow in Him. He don't always expect you to be a baby in Christ. Amen? you got to grow in Christ. Somebody said, well, we'll grow together. Yes, we will. But some babies grow faster than others. Some people don't grow at all. I was watching on, on the TV. They had what they call the, uh, now, believe it or not, what's it called? Ripley's. The woman was 38 years old at that time. And I started thinking, God, how many people's in the church yes, sir. Yes, sir. that knows you for 38 years that are still babies of God? Yes, that won't go beyond.
John 3, 16. That won't go beyond just saying, I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. That won't go beyond just saying, here's my food, God bless it. We're still in the baby stage. God said, I want you to grow up. How can we grow up? Let me tell you how. I just read it a while ago. Them that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. If you seek after God, you will find Him. If He's at the door knocking, if you open up, He'll come in and sup with you. The only way you can learn the Word of God is for you to open it and ask God to reveal it to you and actually read it. Don't depend on what Ray Goodson tells you every week. Read it for yourself. Find out if I'm telling you the truth. If I'm not, you come to me. We'll pray about it. We'll find out what is. I'm not above God. I believe God and so are you. The difference is I realize it. When are you guys going to? When are we going to be to the point to where you start reading the word and when you come in, it's so burning in you. You say, Pastor, i got to testify. i got something burning in me. I can't wait till I share. When am I going to get the opportunity? you got to have the itching. I call it the preacher's itch. God expects you to do something while you wait. If you turn to the book of Acts, last scripture. I think it's Acts chapter 1. I'm going to read with verse 4. Just follow along. And being assembled together with... With him commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise that the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were coming together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, without this time restore again the kingdom of Israel. And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. Come on. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witness unto both Jerusalem and to all Judea and Samaria and unto the innermost part of the earth. And when he spoke these things, while they beheld, he was taken up in a cloud and received him out of their sight. He was letting them know something. You're going to receive some power. And it's not going to be too long. But never did he say, I want you to go in there and sit down and don't do nothing until you get it. Never seen that, did you? I want you to go to Lazy Boy and get the best recliner TV dinner and black screen TV and wait on the power of God just to hit you across the head. Never seen that. Terry, and wait on it. But don't just sit there. Pray. Wait on me to go pray in the garden, but I want you guys to be praying too. Then I come back and get sleep. Wake them up. I'm going back over and pray. And the Bible said this. It wasn't like Jesus was a mile down the road. The Bible is just a it's a stone throw away. A stone throw away. About what, 30 yards? Too bad? I'm sure they could hear him praying if his sweat become his blood. But they went off to sleep. Gone. <coughs> Church is asleep. God's begging for somebody to call on his name. To quit being babies. To grow up and be soldiers of God. How many can say this morning that I'm tired of being baby? I'm tired of just eating just the milk of the Word. I'm ready for some meat of the Word. 
I'm tired of just being at this spot when I come in week to week. I'm ready to, I'm like, in the meantime, to start growing in God. So that way when it comes, I'll be able to withstand the enemy and be able to step into my calling. I'm ready for that. But in the meantime, I've got to get myself in order. How do you get yourself in order? Start obeying God. Start doing something. Get off your seat and move around. Raise your hands in worship. Praise Him. Give Him glory. Thank you for what He's done. Pray for people. Pray for people other than yourself that you might receive a blessing. Don't pray selfish prayers all the time. Lord. I had a lady tell me one time, she said, my hands were hurting. I went over and prayed for this sister and didn't realize my hands could hurt. Is it not the truth? Raise your hands and testify to it. Come on. My hands ain't hurting no more. Why? Because I blessed somebody else. God healed me. That's how you grow in God. You grow in God like that. Let me say it like this. Not quick. Have y'all heard that? If you got a business and you're starting that business by yourself, it takes a while for that business to get to a point where it supports you. Especially if you started from ground up. But if you have investors and supporters and you got people who believe in you that they're willing to put into you everything you need to help that business start it makes it much easier for you to grow your business in the kingdom of God when you give your life to Christ yes you can make it to the end and you can grow in Christ by yourself but it takes a while sometimes but if you hook up with some investors, some prayer warriors, if you hook up with some people who believe in you, like your pastor and the people of the church, if you put yourself in positions where somebody can help you in your Christian walk, then your life as a Christian begins to flourish a much faster rate than it was if you're trying to do it all by your lonesome. God didn't intend on you to walk this thing alone. He said, I'm going away, but I'm sending a comforter. Who's the comforter? Holy Ghost. If you ask Jesus in your heart, the Holy Ghost is with you. Jesus is there to help you. Intercede for you for the Father. Now your business is moving. Now if you own your business, am I right? If you own your business and you never went to work, how long will your business last? Where you're in the business of growing the kingdom of God. And if you don't work your business, it's going to fail in your life. I got news for you. The kingdom's going to reign. But he wants your business to work too. He wants you to grow. He wants your house to be prosperous. Why? Because he sent many people around you. You got elders, you got teachers, you got preachers, you got evangelists, you got the prophets, you got people who don't mind praying. Use them. You don't have to do it by yourself. If you're here this morning and thinking I'm doing it all by myself, you're wrong. That's what the devil wants you to believe. You're not doing it by yourself. You're not. You got all of heaven back in you. That's enough security right there. I want you to search your life this morning, if you would. Search your mind. Search your heart. If you're here this morning and you're thinking, well, you know it. You know it. You ain't thinking it. You're, you're realizing, hey, I'm at the same place I was six months ago. I'm at the same place I was six weeks ago. I haven't changed in a while. I haven't felt the Spirit of God. I feel like that I'm at, in my meantime, is just keeping me here. I feel like that I can't move. I feel the power of God, but I ain't operating in it. 
If that's you this morning, I'm here to tell you there's help. And it's not on the way, it's here. God is waiting on you. God's saying, step out of your ordinary and get into the extraordinary with Him. Step out of your lack and into the presence of God where all things are possible. Come out of that negative mindset. Come out of where you are right now and come to the presence of God and let your meantime be over. Let your joy come because it's morning. Come out of that stage. Don't stay in that stagnant place. The devil wants you there. If it was up to the devil, he'd keep you there till the Lord come back because he don't want nobody to grow in God. It's time that we as Christians step up to the plate and realize that we're not we're not called to stay where we're at. We're staying to move forward, Steve. We're, stay, we're, we're, we're created to worship and to move forward and to grow in Him. Don't stay in the diaper stage. He said, well, I don't even know Christ. I used to, but I don't now. Well, now's the time to come to Jesus. Right now, don't wait. The longer you wait, the harder it's going to be. The longer you deny him, the harder it's going to be. The longer you keep letting the devil win, that's another victory under his belt. It's time to let the devil know that greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. I'm not going to sit back. I'm not going to be the one that just hinders the word. I'm not going to be the one that hinders the spirit. I'm ready to move forward. Are you ready to move forward? Are you ready to grow in Christ? Are you ready to move out of that situation you're in? If you're serious about it, and you're saying, today's my day. I'm tired of living like I'm living. I've done put it off and put it off and put it off. I done sit here on this pew and slid over till I can't slide no more. I'm tired of holding on to mama and, and daddy's hand. I'm tired of doing all this stuff that keeps me back. I need to get closer to God. I don't want to be where I am at right now. I need to get closer. God, bring me closer. Bring me to you. If that's you, get out of your seat. Don't sit there. Don't deny yourself the love of Christ. Come on right now while he may be found. Come right now. He's ready to help you move. He's ready to bring you forward. Come on, right now.